It's been about 15 years since this happened to me and to this day, I'm still scared to talk about it as I'm afraid that he may still be looking for me. For the safety of my family and loved ones, I will be changing names, including my own. A little backstory at the time, I played video games competitively. I was a part of an all-girls team that competed in tournaments around the country. Being a little naive, I didn't think I could ever run into dangerous people over Xbox Live. But boy was I wrong. One day I was playing random matchmaking with a friend of mine, we'll call him Jake, and he was teamed up with another guy and his friend, we'll call them Peter and TJ. Peter and TJ seemed pretty good and we invited them into a party to play with the rest of us that day. We got to talking and at the end of playing we all sent each other friend requests. Over the next few weeks, Peter and myself would play randomly and on some occasions just talk in the game lobby. Over time we became closer and got to know each other on a personal level, outside of the Xbox Live world. He started off by asking simple questions, what state I was from, what I'd like to do for fun, simple questions that wouldn't set off any red flags. But over time, his questions became more and more personal, like how old I was, do I have a boyfriend, what was my MySpace account, what was my phone number, etc. I ended up adding him on MySpace and even though my MySpace contained some personal information, I will say I did not give him my personal phone number just to be safe. One day Peter asked me to join his lobby because he wanted to talk. I joined his lobby and he started telling me how beautiful I was and that he was in love with me. In love with me? I stated, trying not to sound mean. How could you be in love with me whenever you've never met me? He replied by stating that he didn't need to meet me in person and that he knew that I was the one for him. The one for you? I replied in shock. Peter replied, I want to be with you forever. You're perfect for me. Completely freaked out, I told him that I did not feel the same way and that this was just too weird for me. I left the lobby vowing to not talk to him again. I removed him off of my MySpace account and ignored all invites to join his lobby. The more I ignored Peter, the more persistent he became, literally sending me invites to join his lobby every two minutes. Peter started sending me messages through Xbox Live. Lauren, please don't do this to me, I need you. Lauren, why are you doing this to me? Please, I love you more than you know. Slowly, his messages became more threatening. You better answer me or else. I will make you regret this. And answer me or I will find you. And the one that scared me the most was, I know where you live, and I am coming for you. That was it. I had enough and I blocked him. I knew I should have done this sooner, but like I said, I was a little naive. The messages had stopped and everything seemed quiet. About two weeks later, Peter's friend TJ, his friend from the beginning of the story, invited me to his lobby and I joined. TJ sounded panicked. Lauren, have you talked to Peter lately or had any contact with him? I told him no and then proceeded to tell him that I blocked him and the reason why. TJ told me that Peter had left town and nobody has seen him for about two days. To be honest, I didn't care until TJ informed me. Lauren, he has your information and your address. I honestly think he's coming to see you. What? How could he get my address? That's impossible. TJ proceeded to tell me that Peter had a brother that worked for a company that does the billing for all the memberships. What does that mean? My gamer tag was hooked up to my parents' credit card, which obviously contained the billing address, and I started to freak out. How could this happen? This couldn't be possible. What should I do? Should I call the police? I mean, what could they do? There was no proof that Peter was on his way here. It could just be that he took the stolen credit card information and was planning on spending the money. I had to think this through. Maybe TJ was just trying to scare me, so that I would talk to Peter again. After all, TJ was Peter's friend in real life. Suddenly I remembered that Jake told me that his cousin worked for the billing company also. I know, kind of a small world. So I called Jake and told him about Peter's brother possibly giving out my information and to check and see if someone working there had Peter's last name. Jake called his cousin. About two hours later, Jake called me. 
Jake, in a chilling voice, informed me that Peter did indeed have a family member that worked for the billing department. Jake's cousin also uncovered other secrets about Peter's brother. He was banning people for various reasons, basically deleting their gamer tag. When Peter got mad or upset with someone on Xbox Live, Peter would ask his brother to delete or ban their account. Well, needless to say that Peter's brother was fired from the company. A few days passed and I got a message from a person that I didn't recognize, stating, Join my lobby now. I have information about Peter. Now I know what you're thinking. Don't go into that lobby. But to be honest, I was curious about what happened, so I joined. To my shock, it was Peter. Great. Before I could leave the lobby, Peter shouted, You got my brother fired. Trying to be a tough girl, I yelled back, Yeah, your brother was doing illegal things and deserved it. And boy, did that make him angry. Don't forget, Lauren. I still have your address and I'm coming for you now. I'll make you regret everything you did. At this time, I didn't know that this was going to be the last thing Peter said to me. Admittedly, I was a little scared, but he said this before and nothing came about from it. Was he really going to drive across the country just to get revenge on someone he's never met? Two days later, I was upstairs playing online with some of my friends when the doorbell rang. My dad answered the door and said, hello, come on in. I didn't think anything about it until my mom called me downstairs and said that someone wanted to speak to me. Okay, now I was scared. My mind immediately went to Peter. God, was he here? What does he want? Is he going to hurt us? As I walked downstairs, I was shaking so hard that I thought I was going to pass out. As I turned the corner into the dining room, I saw that it was two police officers. They told me to sit down and began asking if I knew a Peter Smith. Of course, I told them everything, and if you're wondering, my parents had no knowledge of this, so you can imagine their surprise. The two officers informed me that Peter was caught in New Mexico. He was driving recklessly and under the influence. When they went to search his car, most likely looking for drugs, they had found handcuffs, rope, duct tape, trash bags, a knife, and chloroform. The police asked Peter what all this was for and since Peter was high out of his mind, he told them that he was going to kidnap and kill that girl. The officers also found printed out directions from his home to my address with the name on top of the sheet that read, Happiness. I froze. He was only one day away from reaching his destination and from here things get a little blurry. Since I was a minor at the time and my parents chose not to let me go to court to testify as our attorney stated that he basically confessed and that Peter was going to be found guilty of attempted kidnapping and possession of illegal drugs. I don't know what his sentencing was and I know I could easily search his name but I want to leave it behind. My name was kept out of the records because I was a minor and thankfully I prefer it that way. Since then I have moved out of that house to another state and have since gotten married. To this day I feel like I need to keep my guard up due to the anxiety from this incident alone. And to all the gamers out there, male or female, be careful who you talk to because you never know who is on the other end. I'm going to recount my most traumatic memory, and what you are about to hear is something that still heavily bothers me to this day. The following events happened five years ago when I was 17 years old. Before we begin, I should also note that I'm a female. One summer night, my best friend Hannah came over to my house for the weekend. Saturday night, we stayed up late, watched some movies, devoured junk food, etc. You know, the typical sleepover stuff. After our final movie of the evening came to an end, I decided to take a shower. It was around 1am and after our horror movie marathon, I was pretty paranoid. So I asked Hannah to sit in the bathroom with me while I showered. Being the good sport that she was, she agreed. While I showered, Hannah sat on the toilet and played some music on her cell phone. 
We spent my 20 minute shower session talking about whatever came to mind and singing along with the music. When I was done, I got out and grabbed a towel. Hannah said my name to show me a meme or something on her phone. I can't remember exactly what it was. I faced her and that's when I saw it. There was movement in the bathroom window above her head. The window distorted it slightly, but my blood ran cold when I realized what I was looking at. A face. A man's face. Smirking at me from the other side of the glass. The man ducked out of view for a moment and I quickly faced away to wrap my towel around my exposed body. I whispered to Hannah that there was a man looking in the window and she laughed it off, thinking I was messing with her. She bravely stands up and, to her horror, comes face to face with the man, still watching, still smirking. We run out of the bathroom and wake my parents, but by the time my dad gets outside, this creep is already long gone and for his sake, he should be glad. When it comes to his little girl, my dad is a force to be reckoned with. The next day, my parents investigated outside the bathroom window and what they found still haunts me. There was a cinder block underneath the window that the man had stood on to get a better look, insinuating this probably wasn't the first time he's peeped at me. And here comes the worst part. Stuffed between the block and the wall was a Ziploc bag of lotion. The window cling was useless as you could see everything inside the bathroom clearly from the outside but we didn't know that at the time. I still can't shower or even sleep without having every window in my house covered and I don't think that will ever change. My best friend of 15 years has always dated terrible men, like her first boyfriend sold drugs in high school. One of six years forced her to hook up with his friends and constantly put her down. Another stole $18,000 from her and beat her, and more, but you get the point. She always dated awful men and hides it all from me because she knows that I'll kick the dude back up into his mom's baby canal. So she always hides it from me. Tells me everything is wonderful till the relationship is finally over. She also can't see any wrong in these men and the more I point it out these dudes are bad she just gets angry and yeah, that's me. Calls me a liar or jealous and will always believe the dude over me and distance herself. Thus over the years I have emotionally detached myself from her and just enjoy time together and let her do whatever. Six years ago I was up on the old dating game before I had met my current boyfriend and this guy played League of Legends as to die. Well, heaven forbid a gamer girl crossed this dude's path as he did a full-blown obsession mode over nine months and was stalking me. Now I'm tiny, and six years ago I was 22, 4'11 and 110 pounds. At first he tried to uncover that I was actually underage asking all kinds of obvious trick questions, telling me it's okay if I'm underage, we just couldn't tell anyone. Red flag number one. Also, our first date was a hike in the woods. Seriously bad idea, ladies. He consistently tried to get laid in 40 degree weather and was super pushy. He was good looking, so I was dumb and caught way off guard by his behaviors. But after the first date, he goes on about how he'd lower his standards for me because he wasn't a fan of thin chicks usually. Well, I had another amazing guy I went on a date with and started seeing and straight up blocked this guy. A couple of weeks later, I'm at a small family-owned coffee shop in my town that I go to so I could study away from my loud life at home. And dumb me actually pointed out five minutes away from said hike was my favorite coffee shop. So one morning, the guy I'm seeing planned to meet me there because roommate life left alone time and home impossible. Well, League of Legends guy was sitting there in the far corner as I walked in. He got up immediately to greet me and asked why I deleted Tinder and was hoping to catch me here. I was absolutely speechless. Just pure WTF. He blabbered on how I hadn't logged on to League in weeks and he's been trying to contact me. I had picked up another game anyways. Only thing I could think of saying was, yeah sorry I met someone. Well that goes over well with this raging gaming guy with the temper of a toddler. 
he starts yelling at me for leading him on. The owner, being somewhat of a strong large lady, gets tired of this guy real quick and after he tosses over a sugar caddy and throws his mug, she picked up this bat-like paddle thing and threatens him to leave or else. Obviously shaken up, the staff try and comfort me as I had become well known to them and made me some tea to calm me down and they call the police. While I'm in tears, the troopers show up and I tell them who he is and why he was throwing a fit. About this time, the guy I was seeing walks in with a super concerned look on his face and I explain and we move on. A month passes and I decided to go back to my coffee shop and relieved to be there without a crybaby in my face. So I keep going back for a week but during this time at some point this dude tracked me. Like literally put a tracker that you pay for monthly in my car tracked me. I only found out months after when I needed work done on my car but it'll give you clarity on how this dude was popping up wherever I was at the most random times. At school, Walmart, even the park. My theory was that he hired a PI to follow me or something because no dude has the free time to follow a girl this much. My theory stemmed a little too much on my love for Veronica Mars to be honest so a tracking device was the furthest thing from my mind. For the first month he didn't approach me, just basically make it known that he was there. But he came by on one of my dates with the guy I was seeing and started telling the guy I was seeing that I was seeing multiple men and such and yelling at me calling whatever names his enraged mind felt. We of course go to the cops after I explained to him, then explained to the cops, but of course, he didn't physically hurt me so what's a cop to do, right? Because nothing says protection of the people like, nah we only help if he hurts or kills you first, sorry. So this harassment continues and eventually drove the guy I was seeing to be distant and eventually away. About four months in though, I left on vacation and I get a text from my roommate that my boyfriend came by and asked to grab some clothes that he had left in my room. Bold, right? But my roommate being smart and aware of the situation and a depiction of the guy knew something was off and said that he couldn't come in but he'd grab whatever it is from my room for him. I told him thank you and explained definitely it sounded like the creep. Now here's where I get scared. I came home from vacation to find my bedroom trashed, my clothes with bleach on them and the floor absolutely ruined, my gaming PC stolen. I called the cops and obviously only my room had this and I pointed to them to my previous complaint. They do their CSI thing and leave only to tell me weeks later that they didn't find any evidence to tie him or anyone to it. I had to pay for the floorboards to be torn up new clothes, and a new PC, which I had to take a loan out for all of it. I ended up moving back with my parents soon after, and my dad has top-notch security, so I felt a lot safer. Around two months go by and nothing. I begin to feel safe again and met a guy at college, my current boyfriend, and we grew close fast because we had a lot in common. We met volunteering for stray cats on campus, catch and release, building shelters, and feeding. We also both enjoyed video games and hiking so it was a good match. But douche league guy wasn't quite done yet. One night we were on a date at a sushi and league guy sits down at our table. Not even kidding you, I was shocked. He proceeded to tell my now boyfriend how this league guy and I have been seeing each other and I was cheating on him with my boyfriend. Well my current boyfriend isn't such a smuck and already knew of this guy and asked me right off the bat, is this a guy? My boyfriend stands at six foot two and lifts weights as he's a field guy for very large wild animals as a wildlife veterinarian assistant. He's very intimidating despite his very gentle nature and it was all a show as he's not a scary dude but he stood up and told the guy to leave. Nothing super clever but it was effective. We called it in early night and we went back to his parents basement to watch some movies. At 5 a.m. before the sun was up there was loud banging on the door so of course him, his parents and I ran to the door. His parents not knowing I was there as girls weren't supposed to sleep over in their family. We look out to see an incredibly drunk League of Legends guy pounding on the door saying gumbled garbage and calling me a cheater and whatnot. Cops are called and he takes off and cops didn't really put up much of a chase. Statements were had, a ton of explaining was given to his parents 
long story, but they're a religious family. And after all this, I tried to get a restraining order, but I didn't have enough evidence or even this dude's last name. Yep, I only ever added him on Tinder in a video game, so I didn't really have much to go off of. So months go by of me being paranoid, and my last encounter with this guy is month 9, where he came up to me at Walmart at 11pm, telling me he was sorry in hopes we could be friends and get to know each other. You bet I left my cart and went straight to management to walk me to my car. Months later, my starter on my car dies and I take it to the shop. While working on my car, they found a tracker. Asking if I knew it was there because apparently some people put them in their cars in case it gets stolen, I guess. I told them no, I didn't, and I took that thing to the cops. I called a few times, but they never gave an answer if they could track the owner or who it was. Just kind of went nowhere. Fast forward six years, and I'm happily still with the same guy. My best friend started ghosting me, which usually meant she's got a new boyfriend. Now some pretext, how much she will believe a guy over me, I told her how her ex tried sleeping with me one night while we were drinking and she still believes him over me and he repeated cheating on her. Yeah, she's not a great friend, but more like a sister at this point. Like my parents refer to her as my sister. She is family at this point and I can't help but care about it because she's got a lot more good in her. She's just so insecure that she feels she needs a man to feel worth anything. I poke her if she's seeing someone new and she just hides it for months knowing that I'll likely disapprove of the guy. So finally months pass and she shows me a picture and I swear my blood truly ran cold. It's the League of Legends guy. And she goes on and on how amazing and in love they are. She's in deep but I had to try. I told her that was a creep from six years ago. He denies ever knowing me and says I must have confused him with someone else. Despite the hair color change and neck beard he grew, the tattoo on his arm is very unique as is the mole under his nose. I tried effortlessly as did my boyfriend to tell her who he is but she's going in deep and told me off by saying I'm finally happy. Why are you trying to ruin it? Stop lying. I can't be alone forever, blah blah blah. And so this is where we're at now. He doesn't have social media so her Facebook says in a relationship with blank. But there's no doubt in my mind he knows who she is to me as on Facebook there's hundreds of photos of us together, posts about each other and we're listed as sisters on Facebook, even her profile picture is of her and I. And I'll update if he does more bad stuff. I needed somewhere to write this down get advice and most of all sort it all out myself. I'm crying and miss my best friend who's put me on ignore because I won't let this go. I feel lost and without my boyfriend's assurance I'd probably feel crazy. This is back in the mid to late 2000s when I was attending school in the one place I had gone to where no one was bullied, which in turn left me more safe in myself in exploring and doing stupid stuff because there would be no one to comment on what I did on my free time. I could play Pokemon cards, talk Yu-Gi-Oh or do whatever. It was a great year in my life except for this one mishap. Without giving away all too much of my location, there was a murder but Allegedly to people in town, a triple murder a house next to the train tracks just next to a bridge over the trains. I was often walking there to get to the pet store and buy fish and fish food, or something for my bearded dragons who I spent tons of time with. Now to set the tone, this was a little late during the summer so it was slightly dark outside but not dark dark. I go out and on my way to the pet store I see the house by the overpass having police tape around all the doors and windows. I became so curious I thought maybe I could peek in a window and see what it looked like inside. And there were so many rumors but one murder was allegedly confirmed. I wasn't able to see anything through the windows other than a normal looking home. It was a yellow house with wooden outside and white windows and a normal looking wooden door. Not happy with the peaks I decided to sneak inside for a bit just to see if I could find anything. I looked around. Thought no one saw me and climbed in through a cracked window. The first thing to hit me was the stench. It was somewhere in between 
sweet and muddy. Hard to explain, but if you've ever had buns in the oven and forgot them overnight, about that, I suppose. I was in the living room. The bottom floor also had hallways, bathroom, kitchen, game room, and stairs going up. In the kitchen, I was really curious to what a killer eats. However, to my surprise, the food was mostly gone. A few packages of scarce strange things spread out and a bit of seasoning, but it looked like someone helped themselves. The fridge was full, however, but as the power was cut, the things inside had ruined. You'd always leave an unplugged fridge open not to destroy it. At least the older models you would do that. Nothing out of the ordinary anyway. Game room was mostly board games and video games, but I didn't want to take them as I knew the owners might be taking things when returning. I must have been downstairs about 20 minutes before going to the stairs. It felt like they were taunting me to go up. Like as if to say they were waiting. I know the old trick to step closest to a wall not to make noise. I knew I was alone, but the sounds could always creak outside, I thought. I walked up slowly. The stairs were positioned in the middle of the entire house, and I snuck up slowly. On the left were two bedrooms belonging to what I think were children, one with a sign, Do Not Disturb, or similar, and one with flower drawings. I opened, and to my relief, nothing odd in the beds, like blood or the such. No bedding whatsoever, actually. Toys, curtains, a little messy, but it looks mostly normal and like someone just vanished from the room. I didn't bother going through the closets or boxes in the children's room, but I knew what was waiting next. The room where the murder had actually happened. I slowly walked up and took a soft breath, opening the door a little, peeking in before opening it fully. It was not 35 minutes into the time there, and at the end of the room... Now imagine maybe a 26 foot long and 12 feet wide room. The left side when looking in had a ceiling slope, a bed about 18 feet in with the heads to the left and not much before that except mirrors in the right and a spotlight in the wall facing from over the mirror. I thought to myself someone was busy with taking photos. This was way before social media as well. I walk in at the end of the room the entire wall is made up of mirrors just top to toe mirrors and mirrors. I stood in the opening longer than I'm willing to admit as I walk up closer to see the bed. It's got the covers thrown around, making me realize the murder wasn't in the bed at least. They would have taken the sheets and such, I assume. I went in a little closer to see a red stain on one of the middle mirrors. It was like a perfectly round button. I stepped closer looking over the floor for stains before kneeling to look closer, realizing it's a door. I put my finger inside and pushed to the left, opening a closet. This maniac of a woman had an entire wall of closet with, I kid you not, 900 plus pairs of shoes. Every shelf was shoes, high heels, low heels, runner shoes, more boxes than anything and so many I could not describe to you. Imagine 12 feet in length to the roof with shoes packed so tight it looked insane. I was taken aback and took a few steps back, clutching my collar a bit, adjusting my hood. Now, this detail is important. I was often wearing a black hoodie or some other hoodie on my free time. I have overly sensitive ears in the season, so I have to wear earmuffs, hats, or hoods depending on the mood and weather. While I took a couple of steps back in the corner of my eye, I saw two guys outside the window walking on the sidewalk. Friends of mine, actually. I'm not 45 minutes into this little adventure and it's become quite dark outside. I smile wide and wave at my friends and one of them see me, look up, looks out a window downstairs and back up again, poking his friend and pointing to me before screaming like an insane person and running out of there incredibly fast. Me, thinking I wasn't alone in the house, panic and run to the door of the bedroom, dash down the stairs, run to the closest window, force it open and roll out onto the ground outside before running the fastest possible to the pet store closing in 15 minutes, just to spend a couple of hours there with the owners. They were very fond of me, actually. I got myself a couple of gibbyceps, cool fish, you can google them, and made my way home. The house stood there, windows still open, and I made my way home as fast as possible without shaking the bag. And once home, I went right back to Smash Brothers and introducing the new fish before sleeping for school the next day. Once in school, the rumors were out. 
teenagers speaking of the flying head in the house. I was mortified and asked people what happened, and the two guys I saw and others claimed to have seen a floating, pale, scary head on the upstairs window smiling at them. I then realized that me and my sweater in the darkness was dark enough for them to not see anything but my head, and that my hand had been out of view from waving. They had actually thought that some evil spirit was out to get them, making them run for their lives, and according to one of them, the other one actually soiled himself. I've never told anyone the truth for over ten years. I kept it myself, letting the rumor spread, and giggled any time someone made up that they had seen or heard anything. Now, for the record, I am aware ghosts and such are supposedly real, but I always pick a reason and logic first. If it is all tested false, I'm open to other explanations. People made up stories for multiple heads, multiple chasing them from the house and so on. I found out recently that no one wanted to buy the house and it was torn down for a parking lot. I decided to come clean by that point, but no one thinks I was the head in the house or I would have told them. And I actually looked into the actual case very recently and apparently one kid died in that house and the mother took her own life in prison after that. The dad is living with the other kid very far from the same town if my sources are correct. In 2018, right after my husband and I got married, my parents, my husband and I drove to Indianapolis to meet my two great aunts and two great uncles through marriage. We had a really nice dinner at my aunt and uncle's house. I drank two glasses of wine and my husband wasn't happy. We went back to the hotel and my husband and I had a fight about me drinking. I said I was going outside to have a cigarette, but I actually went to the hotel bar. I drank two double shots of vodka very quickly and then the bar was closing. I wanted to keep drinking, so the bartender told me that there was a TGI Fridays that was about a literal five-minute walk away. I had a cigarette then, walked there, and continued drinking. I went outside to smoke, and then my memory gets extremely fuzzy. I remember falling in the parking lot. I also remember that there was a group of people when I got there outside, but now I was alone. I don't remember what happened next when I left the hotel. It was about 10 p.m., Suddenly a man is helping me into his car. He wasn't talking much. He had his arm around my waist and was pushing me into his back seat. I didn't realize the danger that I was in. I was in a different state. I had no idea where I was and I was almost blackout drunk. Suddenly I heard screaming and it was my mom. She ran over and said I was her daughter and to get away from me. He said something about how does he know that she's not lying. I was starting to pass out when suddenly a man, it turned out to be an Uber driver and my husband was in the car, practically carried me back to his car. This made the guy livid who wanted proof my mom was actually my mom. She said she was going to call 911 and according to my mom, he bolted so fast his back door was still opened. I was taken to the hospital and discharged the next day. My husband told me he went to my room and said he was scared because I was missing. They called an Uber and tracked my phone which they found on the ground in the parking lot and it had 2% battery left. I definitely think the man who took me had bad intentions and I don't know if he dropped my phone or if I did. I'm so lucky my husband told my mom when he did or else I could be dead. What kind of person takes a super drunk young woman at almost midnight? It's also odd that he refused to let my mom take me at first. It was only after threatening to call the police that... He actually got scared and fled. So I was at my Barnes and Nobles looking for interior design books. A nice looking associate led me to where it was located all the way back in the corner of the store. As I was looking at some books, I see an average looking man abruptly walk right in front of me and turn the corner. A few seconds later, he did turn right back around, walking in front of me again, only this time very slowly and blatantly looking right into my eyes. I thought to myself, way to make it not so obvious, you freaking idiot. Not to toot my own horn, but I'm used to men checking me out. Being an above-average looking female, you get kind of used to this kind of attention. 
I continued my search, thinking little of it, until a minute later he brushed right past me from behind. He did this three more times, at close proximity with the same creepy gaze. This man wasn't looking for any books. He wasn't even hiding that fact either. He was there solely to prey on me. He brushed by me without saying a word and kept staring into my eyes, and at one point he stopped too close to me before walking the corner again. I tried not to make eye contact and continue with my search, but at this point I was too uncomfortable to continue. Being alone in the back of the store didn't help either. I left that section of the store and looked elsewhere. Not wanting to be followed again, I went to the nutrition section. Yeah, I won't find him here, I thought. After exhausting my search, I waited and looked around. The Barnes & Noble store was pretty empty at this point and it was getting late. Only the associates and a couple people were left and I couldn't see him anywhere. Thinking he had either left the store a while ago or was still somewhere in the store, I opted in leaving. Thinking the coast was clear, I let my guard down and exited. I looked to my left, no one in sight, then looked directly to my right only to see him two feet away from me staring at me and walking towards me. He had waited for me to leave this whole time. He didn't say a word to me. Not wanting to get close, I slowed my pace as he walked right in front of me, then across me. Slowly, with that same creepy stare, he circled back and was right behind me now. The parking lot was completely empty and the only visibility came from a streetlight directly hitting my car. Keys in hand, I power walked to my car and I felt him close behind me. I basically leapt in my car, locking the door shut. Trying not to be shaken, I started my car and took a second to breathe, then pulled out, driving right past him. I saw he was next to his black sedan. Being a paranoid person, I made a mental note of his car. Black sedan, with no license plate. Great. Hope this creep won't follow me. Driving away, I made sure to look at my rearview mirrors, hoping to not be followed. Before driving home, I went to my local grocery store. While at the store, I called the Barnes & Noble about the odd, creepy man, noting what he looked like, what he did, and how I felt it was important to report it so that potentially this doesn't happen to another female there. While I'm walking out with my groceries, I swear I see the same car. No license plate. Black sedan. Running with someone inside. I couldn't get a look at the person inside, and a huge part of me didn't want to. Pulling out of the parking lot, I had basically locked eyes on my rear view mirrors, something too dangerous and a thing I won't do again. Arriving home, I was locked inside with my thoughts. What did he want with me? Was his intention to hurt me? Abduct me? Was he at the grocery store parking lot? Had he followed me home? This happened yesterday and nothing had came of it. All I know is I'm never entering that Barnes & Noble again. To give a little bit of background information, I'm a 17-year-old boy, and I live in a relatively small city in Greece. In the summer of 2020, me and my two best friends that I had at the time decided to visit an abandoned sanatorium that is located on a nearby mountain. For those of you who don't know what a sanatorium is, it's a building usually related to treating people, kind of like a hospital. In this case, it was planned to cure people of a specific disease in the Second World War. My house is not far from the mountain, probably a two hour walk from it, so we decided to hitchhike our way there. Long story short, a man picked us up. He was around the age of 60 and he was okay, I guess. Nothing happened worth mentioning. When we arrived there, it was pretty awesome. The building was huge, but it was not fully structured, hence why it was most likely not used at all. We were planning on spending one or two hours there and then just leaving because one of my friends wanted to sleep over at my house that night and we didn't want to be late. At one time while we were on the roof of the sanatorium, we spotted an old shepherd just passing by with his sheep. For some strange reason we thought it would be a good idea to throw pebbles at him to scare him as we thought that we were somewhat world rulers while standing there. When we did, they probably didn't hit him and he then threatened that he would call the cops on us. He obviously didn't and he kept walking away. 
One of my friends, we'll call him G, had this idea to go after him to supposedly make him more afraid. We agreed and proceeded to run down the stairs of the building and then continued running when we got down. The ground around the sanatorium was at a distance from the road of the mountain and hence it was pretty exciting and easy to run there and go goofy. We kept on running and eventually we never found the man and grew tired. While lying there having nothing else to do and almost leaving, we spotted a motorbike nearby sitting all by itself with a backpack attached to it and the keys in. We were and possibly still are pretty immature and like I said, having nothing else to do, we started searching the backpack. I honestly don't know what was going through our minds doing that on a motorbike that had the keys in it. And then another man popped out of nowhere in the distance. He looked and shouted at us. One of my friends thankfully saw him and immediately alerted us. It was a dumb idea in the first place. What was dumber though is the fact that I never thought that the man owned the motorbike and he would use it to chase us all around the place. So as expected, the thought to take his keys and toss them then just run never crossed our minds. Instead what happened was surely one of the scariest experiences of my life. When he looked at us, we ran and hid in a bush field that was full of thorns. He then had his dog, which we hadn't seen before, look and smell all over for us while he patrolled riding his motorbike all around. We stood terrified for a good 30 minutes and then took peeks outside the bushes. When he and his dog were gone, we were relieved because we honestly thought that he was going to beat the life out of us since he hadn't called the police. We got lost after we got outside into the field and we were going back and forth like lunatics trying to find the main road. When we did, we started walking and hitchhiked our way back home again. And I'm so grateful that two normal people did actually pick us up. I don't know how lucky we were at this point. So many things could have gone wrong. So many stupid decisions that we made along the way. And my advice to you is don't be afraid to try new adventurous things, just don't be an idiot like we were. Many years ago when I was young and fit, I was out exercising before dawn. Our local cemetery was high on a hill, and I would walk up the hill then jog all around the concrete and gravel roads that wound in and around the graves. I had done this many prior mornings and I was not afraid of being in the graveyard pre-daylight. I had family and friends buried there. It was isolated and I felt safe. One of the individuals interred there was a little girl named Kay. Kay was only 12 and starting junior high when an impatient idiot behind the wheel of a car killed her. On my frequent runs past Kay's well-kept grave, I often greeted her, wished her well, expressed my sorrow regarding her short, sweet life. On this particular morning of which I write, I jogged past Kay's grave and called out my greeting. In my head, she spoke urgently to me. It's not safe up here this morning. I jogged on, a bit startled. Of course, I glanced about, but all seemed normal. A few minutes later, Kay spoke again in my mind. There's a man up here. This time I stopped. Suddenly the dark hilltops seemed fraught with danger. My blood ran cold and the hair on the back of my neck stood up were no longer cliches. Still I saw nothing. No man, no movement. But by now every nerve in my body was screaming for me to get out of there. I turned and ran. It was no longer a casual morning jog, it was a sprint for my life. I ran past Kay's grave and back down the steep hill, caring not that my quadriceps complained. And as I fled, I listened for any pursuers, but I heard none. But that did not lessen the overwhelming sense of peril that kept me running hard even after I exited the steep part of my route. The rest of that day and even the remainder of the week, I listened for news of an escaped convict, a murderous madman or anything that would explain Kay's urgent warning, but there was none. I had no doubt then, nor do I many years later, that I was in peril that morning. From whom I do not know, but fifteen years have passed and I can still recall the crystal clarity those two sentences from a poor child put much too early in her grave. It's not safe up here this morning. There's a man up here. I just want to say, thank you, sweet Kay.
To preface this story, I am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. I am open-minded, but I always look for a rational explanation for odd things. My husband and I live on a farm of about 100 acres and raise cattle. It is a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day he died. I am familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. A few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you are unfamiliar with cattle, it is strange for a cow to leave her calf, depending on the cow, of course. Our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there are quite a few haulers around. We figured that the cow probably wandered down into the hauler and died in the brush somewhere, or got into a neighbor's field. My husband looked and looked, but never found her. Never found a body, never found any evidence of that cow. The day she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field where it was all laid down as if something had smashed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was just a weird spooky coincidence. Today, my favorite cow went missing. My husband, sister, and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow. We combed every inch of fields, we searched the haulers, we checked the neighbor's fields, no sign of her. She also had a calf, and was notoriously known to be a good mama, and the calf is still here. I figured she got out into a neighboring cornfield, or perhaps someone stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was the only one missing, until I experienced the strangest thing that makes me think that maybe it is supernatural. My sister and I were out hunting. We were looking for the missing cows and we were also looking for dinner. It was around 6.30 to 7 p.m. And between two of our fields, there is a piece of land that we do not own that juts in between two of the fields we do own. It is mostly a wooded area and is bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cows sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search in there. I've also seen some pretty big bucks in there before. So, maybe we'd be getting ourselves some good deer meat. My sister and I, both in our late 20s, and growing up in woods all around, we always hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled ticks off ourselves. Nothing really scared us, and nothing really scares us now. I crossed over the barbed wire to go look for the cow, and my sister stopped. Which is weird. She is my younger sister, and always follows me no matter where we go. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken, and telling her I had been there before and that I would not take her anywhere dangerous, and she knows that. She kept stalling, and I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire, but kept stopping. Finally, she caught up to me, but as I walked further into the woods, I just got a bad feeling. The only way I can describe it is, it's just ominous and dark. My sister also kept saying that she could not hear me, even though I was talking loudly and was only like two feet away from her. I couldn't have been any further than that. I finally stopped, turned around, and we booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, that feeling went away. My sister went home for a couple of hours because she was so unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if she thought the woods felt off. She says that she was terrified the entire time. I will quote what she said below. It was like we were going down a path, a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore, but it did not feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me want to cry just thinking about it. So I just told myself I was psyching myself out. It was right when we passed the fence, like we were somewhere we should not have been. I was scared. I trust you and everything, of course, but... The feeling I got standing and looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. The farther we went, the worse it got, like a shadow or something screaming at me, telling me to go back. Afterward, I got a heavy feeling making me so tired and sad. This all happened in one evening. We never found the cow or any sign of her, and we never found any good deer to bag. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I feel dread when I think about it, 
I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy. I wanted to recount this story somewhere so I would not forget the details and see if anyone has had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening, supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you, I have never felt anything like that in my entire life, and my sister is never scared, which scared me even more. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.